Hello and welcome to this video series on protective conductors by Adrian Davey from Pure Electrical Training. This video is part one and aims to help you gain a basic understanding of how main equipotential conductors work. In this video, I will talk you through some of the regulations around this topic, definitions you need to know, how to identify an extraneous conductive part, how to size your bonding conductor, where to put the bonding clamp on the pipes, and the principle on how it all works with a bit of theory about current flow in a circuit. These are the books from the IET that I'll be referring to, as ultimately they will be the ones that you have access to throughout your time at college, within the AM2 centre and continuing throughout your career. The amendment numbers and colours will change, but a lot of the content will remain relevant to our electrical installations due to the fundamental principles from which they are written. ES7671 gives the following definitions and describes the earthing conductor, which is the cable that either comes from the DNO's TNS or TNCS supply, or from an earth rod into the distribution board, sometimes wrongly referred to as the main earth, which is often one of the wrong answers in an exam. If you need help in identifying the different earthing arrangements like TNCS, TNS or TT, as well as concentric, split concentric and paper insulated lead covered cables, then please watch my video that aims to aid you in understanding the differences. It will also talk you through the basics on how to select the correct earthing conductor size. The link is in the corner of the screen now. Except where PME conditions apply, a main protective bonding conductor should not be less than half the CSA of the earthing conductor and not less than 6mm squared. Although usually in a domestic installation, you will find that a 10mm squared cable will be installed in most situations. Table 54.8 gives the following examples that you can select without calculation. And in a domestic environment where most installations use 25mm squared meter tails, the main protective bonding conductor would be 10mm squared. And this is what people generally stick to. In part two of this video series, we will be discussing continuity of exposed conductive parts and extraneous conductive parts. So what is the difference? BS7671 gives the definition of a conductive part. An example of this would be a class one light fitting, which would have the following symbol to show that the fitting needs to be earthed. Or something like metal containment used in the installation of electrical circuits. ES7671 also gives the definition of an extraneous conductive part, which would be a conductive part coming out of the mass of earth. Examples would be a metallic pipe for gas or water or structural steel. Essentially, you have an earth rod, which in the event of a fault will allow electrons to flow down them to return to earth and that zero potential. In a fault condition, electrons are going to be attracted to that zero potential. And this means that the extraneous conductive part will become live capable of giving a dangerous electric shock if touched. If we had a fault voltage of 230 volts, this would mean that we have a potential difference of 230 volts to earth. In this example, once the meter is removed, the electrons in a fault condition can no longer flow to earth, but will still be attracted to it. If a person did complete the path to earth, either through themselves or by touching the pipe coming out of the ground at the same time as the live pipe, they would complete the fault path and could receive an electric shock that may be strong enough to cause serious injury or even death. Which is why a trained professional would test the pipework to true earth like the MET or CPC before removing the meter, periodically during work and before reconnecting the meter. With the voltage indicator connected to the difference in potential, the electrons will start to flow to that zero potential and the potential difference will be displayed. This is why it is always a good idea to connect your test probes to the zero potential first so that you are not waving the live end around. If you want to know more on safe isolation, then watch part one of my video that will talk you through the why, what, when and where. The link is in the corner of the screen now. Part two will talk you through the processes and I've put together a simple flow chart to help you. The link for that one is on the other corner of the screen. This is one of the reasons that competent gas engineers put a temporary connection across the pipework when removing the gas meter using these jump leads. Patient develops an electrical fault while they are working on the installation and fault current is trying to flow to that zero earth potential. 
By putting the jump leads across the pipes before the meter is removed, the fault current could still flow to earth while we wait for the fault protection devices to operate. There would then also be no dangerous potential difference between the pipes as both pipes would be equal potential, which I will explain in more detail shortly in the video. This is why we bond the pipework as near as is reasonably practical at the point of entry. Where there is a gas meter, the connection should be made on the consumer side of the gas meter within 600 millimeters, not on the supply side for the reasons we've just been discussing as that would be pointless. And just in case the gas fitters want to adjust the pipework, we also try to ensure that it is before the first join, union or branch in the pipework. So that in a fault condition, the fault current can safely be returned to earth. We also need to consider an accumulation of currents which may come from nearby sources of EMF like cables that are run too close to pipework or from earth leakage. You also need to consider that the boiler is also connected to the water supply. And again, if this supply is metallic and goes into the ground, then you basically have another earth rod that is capable of introducing a zero potential to earth. This means that there is another extraneous conductive part that needs bonding too, and if you use the same cable for both, remember that it needs to be uncut or unbroken, so that if the first clamp comes off or is loose, the second clamp is still effective and sufficient. As you may have noticed by now, other trades have a habit of removing the first clamp when altering pipework and not reinstating the clamp afterwards, which means the bond to both pipes could be simultaneously lost. In an earth fault condition, all of the earthing systems should be raised to the same potential to create a kind of Faraday cage effect for a really short duration until the protective device operates. Regulation 411.3.2.2 gives guidance on the maximum disconnection times and refers to table 41.1 in BS7671. So think about that for a second. We are going to intentionally allow all the metalwork to become live. So how is that even safe? Let me talk you through the basic principle. If you remember from college, we measure potential difference in volts. If we had two metallic pipes and both had zero potential, then we would have no difference between the two, which means zero potential difference. Zero volts minus zero volts equals zero volts. If we then introduce the 230 volts to one pipe, the potential difference between the two would now be 230 volts. 230 volts minus 0 volts equals 230 volts, so we now have a potential difference of 230 volts. If we had 230 volts in one pipe and 110 volts in the other, the potential difference between the two would be 120 volts. 230 volts minus 110 volts equals 120 volts, so a potential difference of 120 volts. Here is the clever bit. If we had 230 volts in one pipe and 230 volts in the other, the potential difference between the two would once again be zero volts. 230 volts minus 230 volts equals zero volts. This means that current cannot flow because it's the potential difference, the voltage that moves the electrons, the current, around the circuit. And since there is no voltage, there is nothing to move those electrons around. In years, scientists thought that electricity flows like water, which is why we talk about a flow of electrons and call it current. Let's try the following analogy. If we had two empty containers and we filled one up, because there is a potential difference in height, there is also a potential difference in pressure. If we attributed a voltage to these containers, as we refer to voltage as a pressure, then you would start to understand the flow of electrons in a circuit. Now at the moment there is no flow as the water has nowhere to go, so it's just sitting there with potential energy, a bit like a broken circuit. But if we connected these containers together by a pipe, what do you think would happen? The water would flow from one container to the next, introducing that pressure to the new container. But we only have a flow as long as there is a potential difference between the two. Once they reach the same potential, then water would no longer flow as it has nowhere to go. Now we have equal potential. And if there is no potential difference to move current around, then the risk of electric shock is minimal, which is why we used to cross bond all our metal pipe work so that they were all around the same potential. However, if current isn't flowing, then the safety devices will not operate. So the reality is that we need somewhere for that current to flow 
in order to keep the current flowing fast enough and long enough that the protective devices will operate and switch off the supply. Which just as a reminder brings us back to this picture and the fault flowing to earth. which then operates the protective device, breaking the circuit and isolating the flow of electrons from the supply. If the supplies are coming out of the ground in plastic, which most new supplies are, then they do not need bonding. Glass will be yellow MDPE pipe and the water will be blue. And being plastic, they are non-conductive. In the next part of this video, we will discuss what the term parallel ways actually means using visual aids before moving on how to test these cables and what to look out for when fault finding. If you haven't seen it already, then please watch my video on how an MFT works, which will help you understand what is going on behind the scenes when testing and will help this next video make more sense. If you can understand what is going on behind the scenes, then you are in a better position to understand inspection and testing, and as a result, fault finding. Fault finding has one of the highest failure rates in the AM2 endpoint assessment, which should not be the case as it is intrinsically linked to inspection and testing because inspection and testing is fault finding. You cannot understand one without the other. Well, that is it for part one of this video where we discussed what are main bonding conductors and why are they important. The second part of this video will talk you through proving continuity using test method two and what parallel ways actually means and why you have to disconnect them. Don't forget that this video can count towards your off-the-job training for your apprenticeship or just for your own CPD. And please ensure that you like, share and subscribe so that everyone can benefit from this content. Thank you and take care.